So welcome back. I uh, hope you all had a nice weekend. Um, obviously tomorrow, midterm exam. Uh, I'll expect to see you uh, in the exam center. And, and information should have gone out already for the room assignments. Um, and I believe it's you know alphabetical order A to L. I think A to L is uh, exam room 100 and M to Z is exam 200. But you should double check that. Um, and I'll, I'll be in a, one of the rooms, obviously. Okay. Any, any questions on midterm? Logistics, content, oh, yeah. chapter 12, right? Yeah. Uh, is it for like defining data lines for queries? Should you define multiple data lines? Or like you just define one? Okay, so question uh, is datum lines for pulley problems. Do you define just one datum line or do you define multiple? And the answer is, of course, it depends on the problem, right? So, and, and you have, and what I did was I did three or four different problems in class. And I think three of them had one datum line, all from the ceiling, drop down. And the, the, the answer really is look at the way your blocks move, right? Your blocks should be moving and you should be tracking its motion as if it was a rectilinear motion from this one particle. So that one problem where I had this block on an incline and it was clearly moving in a direction that was different than just straight up and down. So clearly that's a case where you need a second datum line. Okay, anything else? Yeah, one last question. Sorry? Eight, eight sheet? What about it? What, what, what is it that you're allowed to write on your eight sheet? You are allowed to write whatever you want. Anything you want. If you, if you want, yeah. You can write poetry on it if you want. Uh, anything you like. The, the, only, the, only, the only constraint is you've got one sheet. Eight and a half by eleven. You can write both sides, anything you want. Yeah. For what? Sorry, the the so, AG. Oh no no no. Yeah yeah. So so I I think it is exam type C right where you where you are allowed one eight sheet. You you don't bring anything else except for your pen. Your pencil, uh, your T card. So remember to bring your T card because we will be checking around and asking you guys to sign a form. Um, and that's it. So you won't be bringing any other materials. Okay. Okay. So let's get. Let's get, yeah. Hold on. What's that? What template? Wasn't aware of a template. Yeah. So the question was, do you need to use a template for an H sheet? There is no template. Free form, anything you like, right? In fact, I've seen some people actually type it up really, really nicely and then shrink it down to size six font. <laughs> do, do whatever you like. I'm not sure that's the best use of your time, right? Uh, there are other ways to do it that are, that are better, yeah. Double-sided. Double -sided. Both sides. You can write anything you want, both sides, okay? All right. So, so here we are. We're, we're now in, in the realm of chapter 13 material. Uh, this is stuff that's not going to be on tomorrow's midterm, uh, but, but this is what Professor Sinclair did with you on Friday, and I, I watched a bit of her lecture, and it was an amazing lecture, right? She's, uh, she loves demonstrations, and I love how she gets the whole room energized. Um, and so, so here's what she did, right? She, she covered um, these important forces, gravitational, normal, spring force, and obviously the friction force. Lots of really complicated details with the friction force. But I love that demonstration, right, where there was a volunteer here and she was pushing it on the table, giving you this idea that the static friction force is this, this inequality, right? It has to be that there's a maximum amount for the friction, but any time the object doesn't move, the static friction force is actually responding to how much you're applying, right? So all of that's, all of that's really, really nice. So what do we do now? What we have to do now is I, I'm, I'm back on the Monday and I'm teaching this lecture now, picking up where she left off. Instead of all the conceptual stuff, I'm going to throw equations at you. Okay? And where are these equations coming from? So we're going to first look at, let me just say here, so, so let me skip ahead and let's say you look at the meat, the meat of chapter, chapter 13. So this is chapter 13.4 to 13.6 in your textbooks. And it's going to be like Newton's second law. for like all three different coordinate systems. Okay? So picture, picture this, and I'll, I'll just write them all on the board and we can just kind of look at them for a bit. 
and contemplate what all that means. But, but we're basically taking the following, right? We're taking the, the equation that we're familiar with, Newton's second law. Sum of forces external to the particle acting on it is equal to mass times acceleration, vectors on both sides. And here's what you do. You take your rectangular coordinate system, right? And we're in x, y, and z. So you take this vector, and you're going to break it up into x component, y component, z component. And because you've break, broken them up into components, they are now all just scalars. So this is now sum of forces in the x is max. Sum of forces in the y is may. Sum of forces in the z is maz. Really, really easy conceptually. And the idea there is obviously this ax, ay, and az, they were all part of that same acceleration vector because the acceleration vector would have been written as this, right? axi plus ayj plus azk, right? So they were just the components, just the components of the vector. So nothing surprising there. And then what, you, what do you do? Now that we've, we've gone through all the other coordinate systems, you just kind of work your way through them, normal and tangential. Okay, so this is the one where you've got a curvilinear path, and you have your tangential and normal unit vectors on the curve. And so how, how are the forces going to be acting on this particle that lead to its kinematic motion? It's going to be the following. You're going to take your forces, and they're going to be now in the tangential direction. right? So you're going to see forces in the tangential is mass times acceleration in the tangential. Force normal is mass times acceleration in the normal. And then I'll even give you that third dimension, the B. The B is binormal, right? And then this B direction is going to be now pointing out of the page, right? So it's going to be MAB. Um, and there's a really important result that comes from the fact that we're looking in the binormal direction. As it turns out, this is always going to be 0. OK, so that's a really important point, because if your, if your particle is moving in a curvilinear path, all the forces have to be acting in the plane that cuts through that curve and cuts through the t and n unit vectors. Okay? And there's a, there's a physical meaning behind it. The reason is because the particle can accelerate in only two directions. It can only change its speed, the magnitude of its velocity. So if it, if it speeds up, then you've got an at that's non-zero. So there must be a force acting in the tangential direction. And when it turns the corner, every time it turns a corner, there's a radius of curvature associated with it. That radius of curvature is, is going to allow the, um, the, the, the particle to turn that curve. right? And you know that the acceleration in that normal direction is what? The speed squared over rho. Right? All of that means that there must have been a force that was tugging on it, pushing on it, into the concave side of that curve. So all the forces act on the t and the n side, basically meaning that in the binormal direction, there are no forces. Okay? So there's your normal and tangential. And then finally, we're going to do the polar coordinates. Right? And there's no surprise here. R, theta, and z because it's going to be like a cylinder in the third dimension. So fr is mar.
Okay. Okay, and so as, as you would expect, you take your you take your acceleration vector. It's going to be in the form of an a r u r, a theta u theta, and if there is a third dimension, a z, so u z k. Or maybe we'll just do a z u u z just for consistency here. Okay. Okay. Nice and easy, right? It looks really, really easy. So where, why is it so complicated? It's because we're going to start throwing up problems that are going to start looking like the following. Okay, so you might start seeing problems like this, pretty standard. Let's say you have a mass sit, sitting on an incline, which is at a slope that's given by an angle theta. And then you want to know its motion. You want to know how fast it's accelerating or how fast it's moving in terms of its speed. Maybe you give it a little tug, right? You pull on the mass, and the spring acts and gives you a force that pulls the object back. And then maybe there's some friction between the block, the mass m, and the incline. So once, you, once you're given problems like this, how do you go about actually solving, solving the problem? Right? And so the, fir the first thing that we have to get really, really used to is this idea of the free body diagram. And I imagine this is going to be review from Civ 100 because you do lots of those, and the object is not moving in those cases. All the sum of the forces are zero, and thus that's that's the twist that we have here. Things are actually accelerating. So how would how would we do a free body diagram for this particular system, this particular problem? When we say free body, we mean just isolate the body that you're trying to analyze, that you want the velocity and acceleration for. So in this particular case, you take the mass. You isolate it, and you remove all of the other elements. So forget the, forget the uh, drawing the incline or drawing the spring again. But you now apply all of the forces that act on this mass um, that are so sort of that follow what Professor Sinclair was talking about last class, right? All of those things, the gravitational, the normal force, et cetera. So let's do a little quick, a quick demo here of what all the forces should look like on this mass. Let's say this is my. This is gravity acting downwards, right, like that. And just for convenience sake, I'm actually going to turn this around and make my x, y coordinates look like this. So I'm going to make x actually coincide with the downward direction of my incline. So I rotated it by an angle theta. This is something that's really convenient to do. Um, and I can explain that. I can explain that a bit later. So where, where are all the forces acting? Let's start with uh, the weight. So the weight is going to be acting in the direction of gravity. So we're going to draw that downward, and we're going to say this is going to be mg. Normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So that's this one right here. That's my Fn. Okay. And by the way, this Fn clearly acts theta degrees away from, the, away from the, the vertical axis, right? which basically then means that this mg is also 30 degrees away from the fn vector. Okay? And then so what are the forces now acting along the incline? Well, first of all, if I pull on the mass, clearly I have an applied force. So I usually call this like just f applied. 
Okay? And because I'm pulling it downward, the motion of the block is, is down. I'm forcing it to move down, and it's moving against the surface of the, of the incline. So there has to be a friction force, and the friction force acts opposite to the direction of motion and acts at that interface. So I'll draw my force friction there. Okay. And, and by, the, by the way, if the block is moving, what kind of friction is it? Kinetic friction, right? Kinetic or dynamic friction is what we call it. And then you would be forced to use which coefficient? Coefficient of kinetic friction, the mu k, right? OK, and then there's one more force here that we're missing, and that's the spring force. The spring force is now, let's assume that what I've drawn here is the initial stretch of the spring, and I've forced the block downward. I've pulled on it, I've tugged on it, and basically stretched the spring. Where is the spring force going to be acting? Which direction? It'll be back up this way. So this is my four spring FS. So this, this, is my, this is my free body diagram. Isolating the block, that's of interest, drawing all the forces that are acting on it, and then not, not worrying about, the, not worrying about the, the incline and redrawing the spring and all that. OK? So there's your, there's your free body diagram right there. OK? Any, any thoughts or questions on that? Mm -hmm. Like with the force of the spring should be equal to the trial force because it's like if this goes down, it went up. Well, I, I haven't done, the question is what is the spring force equal to? I haven't shown you at all how to do the analysis yet. That's where the analysis comes in, right? Like if I ask you what, what value should Fs be, it all depends on how big F applied is and how big Ff is and everything else, right? So we'll get to that because the next step is I'm just going to do Example upon example, walking you through all of the different coordinate systems so that you're familiar with each and every one of them. Okay. Uh, is it incorrect to use like a draw force like a boss force if you wanted to accurately just draw, or draw where all the forces act on the boss? Like, you know, there could be like the force of friction, obviously, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The force of uh, friction or the, uh, the spring started. Yeah. Different forces. Or can it be just like two obviously distinct arrows instead of the same Excellent question. Question is, for, for, for the purposes of this particular chapter, right? I'm dealing with what? Particle kinetics. And we already set that for particles. We don't worry about the size. We don't worry about the shape. So why did I draw a box there? Is it OK for me to draw a dot and then just have arrows extending from the dot? Absolutely. Totally allowed to do it in this chapter for particle motion, right? So if, you are, if you're really, really good at drawing diagrams and you're, you're good at keeping track of your arrows and you want to do it, the way that this student suggested, you're absolutely free to do it. Let's, let's do that. Let me draw a particle like this, all right? Fs. You, you have this little issue of like maybe the arrows kind of looking like they overlap a little bit, but assuming that you're able to actually manage to do that on your sheet of paper and not get confused, totally OK to do that, right? You're doing particles. You can think of them as neutrons and protons if you like. No big deal. The problem comes when we start doing work in chapter 16 or chapter 17, where it is now kinetics of rigid bodies. So in kinetics of rigid bodies, we're, we're going to start looking at things like what? Like wheels, right, and disks, and things where you're going to have a center of mass of the wheel and then the edge of the wheel. Then you're going to start wanting to always do it this way. So I figured since we're going to head in that direction anyways, I might as well start you guys off here. Make sure that you guys start recognizing the look of a rigid body, right? But, but, but good question. Anything, anything else? OK, so uh, what did I promise? I promised lots and lots of examples. So let's move on to some examples. OK, I'm going to start off with, uh, with two easy ones, and we're going to stick with the uh, xy coordinates for a bit. Let's do a really, really easy example. Do 
All right. So here's, here's, a, here's a really, really easy, easy example, but illustrative. Illustrates a bunch of really in, in, important concepts for you to carry over. So I've got a car, a car sitting on a four degree incline, and uh, it's, it's initially moving at a speed of v naught equal to 90 kilometers per hour. Um, and the idea is in the problem, you're just told that there's this force break, this F break, and you're given this value, so 7,500 newtons. Okay? Now, when I say F break, and, and what's implied in this problem is the fact that clearly there are many, many things happening during the braking process. You know, the brake pads are being applied um, on, the, on, the, on the disc. Uh, there's tires that are, that are uh, sometimes they're, they're sliding a bit, but not only are they sliding and slipping, but they're actually they're rubbing against the surface, etc. We're going to lump all of those together and just apply one force F brake. Okay? That's, the, that's what's implied in the problem, is don't worry about all the other things. Um, and then you're given the mass of the vehicle, and all it says is, can you find and estimate the braking distance? Okay, so delta S is just how long does it take on this stretch of road at, this, at, uh, at these conditions for it to come to a complete stop? Okay, so when does the car completely stop? Okay, so, so this is a really good example because it's really easy, but it just gives us a few things to work on just to remind ourselves of the process. Um, and and I, will, I will say this, right? The, the number one goal in, in all of, in this course really is just to teach you the problem solving process. So you're not expected to know how the answer comes out every single time. We're here to teach you, like if you don't know the answer, you don't even know how to approach it, you just follow the process, right? Follow the steps. And so the first step, free body diagram no matter what, right? Free body diagram all the time. Mg, normal force up this way. And then the F brake is meant to be applied just like I showed you for the other incline problem parallel to the incline. Okay, so clearly you got three forces. X and Y components seem to be a really, really good idea. So right away, rectangular coordinates. And so here's the, here's the, first, here's the first question. How do you orient the axes, right? So the, your first thought might be, well, I'm really, really used to doing this. So you could try an x, y that's just oriented parallel to the ground, uh, par parallel to, sorry, the, um, you know, almost like the y is parallel to the gravity, and then x is actually just straight across horizontal. So what, what do you think happens when you do this? It means that both of these vectors then actually end up having to have components to them. So you're going to have to apply a four degree angle on this, like a sine four and a cosine four, and then a sine four and a cosine four on this guy, just so that you can get the components lined up. So it's kind of a lazy thing to do, but it works really, really well. But the idea is if you count the number of forces and which ones are parallel and perpendicular to which coordinate frame, you can easily do it this way. And that means that these two are already in x and y completely, and only this one has components. Okay, so I'll do this. This is my theta. Okay, and what that means is if this is my total force mg, and this is my angle theta, the two components, when you break them up in this frame of reference, you're basically going to have this one right here, which is the one that is parallel to the y axis. And then you've got this little bit right here. And that little bit right there is parallel to the x. OK, so there's your free body diagram. Three forces, one of them broken up into two components. And then away you go. You write your fx max equation and your fy may equation. So everything on the left hand side are all of the forces that you see in the free body diagram acting in that particular direction. So all of these forces must therefore be this component right here, the mg that's acting in the x. So this is my mg sine 4 degrees. 
and then minus my f break. And that's equal to max. Okay. And then for the y, the y. Right. Now, what do we know about the y? So this is another really important thing. It's really easy when you orient your axes this way, because we immediately know that the car is not lifting off the ground. It's not accelerating in the y direction, so this is actually zero. It means the forces have to be balanced in that direction. And what that then means is that your Fn minus your mg cosine four degrees must be equal to zero. OK, so where do we go from here? Basically, what we're going to see is we can actually plug in numbers, and the one unknown from the x, the, the x direction is going to be my ax. So I can actually rearrange the ax to be as follows. It could just be your mg sine of 4 degrees minus f break divided by mass. Okay, and you just plug everything in. I'll give you AX is negative 5.32 meters per second square. And clearly, because the force break was given to you as a constant and all the other values were constant, this leads to a constant acceleration. It's minus 5.32. Now that you know the problem is based on a constant acceleration in the x direction, now you can go back to your, your, your kinematic equations to figure out exactly what delta s is. So delta s should be so now delta s. So what do we have in terms of information? We have the final velocity, which is 0. We're hoping to have it stop. And then we have the initial velocity, and we have acceleration, which is constant. So the most logical equation would be this one. Right? That's the form of the equation we want. Delta s, therefore, is rearrange to be that. So 90, 90 kilometers per hour, by the way, is, I believe, equal to 25, 25 meters per second. So you can do your conversion. 25 meters per second, all squared. Like so. Okay, and so your answer is 58.7 meters is the stopping distance, which is uh, which is pretty, <laughs> which is pretty high, right? It's that's a lot. It's a long way to go. So I think this I think this driver needs to slam on the brakes a little harder in this case, but. Um, but there, but there you have it. I think easy example, but make, make, it allows us to at least talk about you know, the free body diagram once and why we rotated the axes a little bit, um, and then brings in all of these kinematic type formulas that we've been working on. OK? OK, anything else? Yeah? Can you explain why you didn't consider friction in this question? Uh, it, it, was lumped, it was lumped into the F break. So a, as the way the question was worded, it just basically said, look, there's going to be friction between the tire and the road, and everything is going to be part of this braking force. Okay, so it was lumped in. Okay. 
Anything else? OK, and then let me do one more example today. Let me do a pulley example. All right. <clears throat> All right. So I've, I've got a, I've got a pulley example on the board here. Basically, what we're saying is, let us think of two cases. Okay. And these two cases are very very similar to each other. In the first case, I've got block A hanging on the left side of the pulley. And just a, you're told that a force is being applied on the left, on the right, that's pulling on the rope at exactly 98.1 newtons. Okay, so that is that is the downward force being applied on the rope. Okay, and in case two, what you're told is it's not just one block; it's actually two blocks. It's an, a block A and a block B, and block B happens to have exactly a mass of 10 kilograms. And we all know that if mass B has 10 kilograms, then the weight of this block is 10 times 9.81, so it equates to 98.1 newtons. Okay, and so the block is doing the job of the downward force in case one. Um, and the question is, uh, do these two problems in two cases have exactly the same acceleration for blocks A? Okay. So how many people say, yes, they should be the exact same acceleration? OK. It's fine. No, it's fine. Absolutely. This is all your, based on intuition, right? So I see a few hands go up. How many people say, no, they have, they have to be different? With the, with the way he's standing up there asking this question, it just has to be different, right? Yeah. Just intuitively, that's the only reason why he would bring it up. So let's, let's do the analysis. How do you prove that they're either the same or different? So what is the first thing that you have to do? Free, free body diagram, please. Please, for everyone's sake, do your free body diagram. OK, so let's, let's work on case one. OK, so, so free body diagram for case one, right? Really easy. We're going to do our. Mass A, mg. In fact, I'm going to write this as mag. Okay. And the the force that we always say is the force on a piece of rope. We call that tension. So I'm going to give that a capital T. And then I'm I'm telling you from the diagram that plus is a uh, plus sign is upwards, or upwards is a positive sense of direction. Okay. So what do you what do you do here? Really, really easy. You stick with your rectangular coordinates, and you would expect it to just be 
Fy is equal to m sub a a y, like that. Okay. In fact, I'm going to actually change this to be a a. Okay. So m a and a a, and I'm going to start ignoring x and y components because there are there really is nothing going on in the x component here. So you're going to see my subscripts just be the a's and b's, right? So what are the forces acting on it? it must be T minus m a g. And this must be equal to m a a a. OK? What is tension in the rope in case number one? It is exactly 98.1, because the tension in the rope is everywhere along the rope. Right? When you pull on it from one spot, it's going to transmit directly through the rope. So if I rearrange, a a must be equal to the following. 98.1 newtons given to you minus the 20 kilograms, 9.81, divided by uh, 20 kilograms. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, did I? Uh, it's all good. So AA is going to be equal to, in this particular case, it's actually going to be negative 4.9 meter per second squared. So it's actually 4.9 meters per second squared downward. It basically means that the mass here, it's really, really heavy, right? So the 98.1 actually didn't pull it up, right? It was just resisting the fact that the mass was falling down. So it's actually accelerating in this direction. A is equal to 4.9 meter per second squared downward. OK, so that's where the nine minus sign comes in. OK, so now let's do, let's do case number two. OK, free body diagrams for case number two. You've got block A, M, A, G, and then T upward, still like that. And then obviously now that you have two objects in the system, you need a second free body diagram. This one is M, B, G down, and it is also tension upward. And again, the tension is the same in the rope. What is the tension? How many people think the tension should be 98.1? We don't know yet, right? So in this particular problem, the trick is the fact that tension is actually a, is a, is an unknown. We don't know what tension is until we've completed the analysis. So let's write out, what we have to do is write out the, the F is equal to MA in the Y direction for both of these blocks and see what happens. So I'm going to do for block A, block A says the following. Sum of forces is MAAA is equal to T minus MAG. For block B, MBAB is, so it's still positive in the upward direction. It's still T is minus MBG. Formulas look exactly the same. So how many unknowns do we have? Looks to me like we don't know AA, AB, and we also don't know T. So we've got three unknowns and only two equations. We need to find a third equation somehow. Anybody know how we can find a third equation? Dependent motion analysis between the two masses. Absolutely, right? So simple pulley problem. It looks to me like if you just did your, yeah, I mean, you, could, you can get really complicated here and say you got a datum line, et cetera, right? Do we need to do that here? Probably not, right? Your third equation is very simply AA 
is negative AB, right? One is moving opposite direction to the other, and they have to be the same in value. Okay? So that, that's, a, that's a huge help. Now you finally got your three equations and three unknowns, and we can do some rearranging. So let me do that. So let's see how I managed to do this. Okay, so it looks to me like what I did was I just simply uh, added the equations maybe, 20 AG, 20 G minus 20. Okay, so I rearranged a bit, so rearrange for A. Rearrange for A is what I did. Sorry about that. So what I did was rearrange for A and I moved T onto the left-hand side and that allowed me to do MA AA plus MAG. There's probably multiple ways to do this at this point, but I'll show you my way. And what does that do? Okay, and then also T is also equal to, if I rearrange the other one, MBAB minus uh, plus MBG. So this is AB plus MBG. But this AB, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in minus AA. So a MB negative AA, like that, plus MBG. Okay? And that allows me to equate this one with this one, et cetera. So we're going to do... MB like that. So make them equal, and then I'm going to rearrange them all, and you should get the following. This one minus that one divided by MA plus MB. And the answer is plus 3.27 meters per second squared. And then AB is equal to, sorry, did I do that? No, it's actually the negative here. Sorry, my mistake. And then AB is plus 3.27. Okay, so AA is still moving down, but it's moving down at a much slower acceleration than in case number one. So the value has clearly changed, and it's all due to the fact that the presence of this block, this block B, is not the same as me saying 98.1 Newton straight down on the rope. In fact, now that you have these answers and you've solved this, what, what should you do to figure out tension? You just simply plug in this value for AA back into here just to check your tension. So you can check your tension T. Plugging it back in, you'll find that T is actually equal to, what I do here, I did 10, 9.81, 10 times 3.27. So I plugged in some numbers into one of those tension equations, and lo and behold, I have an answer of 130.8, let's say 131. Okay, so as it turns out, that second block forced the rope to actually carry more tension. The rope is now, having, is now um, transmitting 131 newtons of tension instead of 98.1. And it's because basically you've got two masses that are hanging on this pulley at the same time. And so the other, the other mass, mass A, is now feeling it, 
feeling what's happening with mass B as it's being pulled down on that pulley. OK? Does that, does that kind of clear it for you in terms of, I think this, this example right here is really just I don't know, conceptually to say, don't try to take shortcuts when you're doing problems. Right? If you see something like a mass that's hanging off a rope, not the same thing if you just replace it right, with a 98.1. Clearly, you can't do that. And second important point is always draw your free body diagrams. Right? Draw it for one particle, draw it for both particles. Um, and then I guess there was a little twist in there where you had to use dependent motion analysis to get your third equation. And you're going to see more and more of that too as we, as we, as we go further in this course. OK? Any, any questions on all of those concepts? No. OK. If not, we'll pick this up again on Wednesday. And we'll uh, see you then. <laughs>